psychiatrists still tout the benefits of lobotomy, a treatment that earns them $31 million annually. But in the wake of lobotomy's tarnished reputation, psychiatrists were quick to push electroshock back into the spotlight. Renaming it electroconvulsive therapy, they now give patients anesthetics to squash their screams and paralyzing agents to avoid watching the writhing of agony. The main misconception that people have about ECT is that it's new and improved. The new and improved refers strictly to these uh, cosmetic improvements because, in fact, they make it easier on the witnesses. The person isn't shaking all over the table. They're paralyzed now. It isn't new, it isn't improved, it is worse. Every 10 years or so there tends to be, uh, first of all, a denial that it causes any harm. Secondly, an acknowledgement that it might have caused harm, but here's a whole new approach and now this one is blameless without any research to back it up. The ECT machine can pr produce anywhere from 50 to 400 volts. It's the kind of energy that we use for industrial machinery that might be in a steel mill or, some, or a printing press, some large piece of machinery. It's an extraordinary amount of energy and it causes a great deal of damage. And while stories of prisoners physically mistreated with electroshock are well publicized, the amount of electricity doled out by psychiatrists for ECT is up to 33 times greater. And that damage is most often targeted at the most vulnerable. Two-thirds of those who receive electroshock are women. Given such diagnoses as premenstrual syndrome, menopausal disorder, or postpartum depression, half of electroshock patients are elderly. Once they become eligible for government health care at age 65, 360% more American seniors receive ECT than at age 64. And what does this all add up to? 40,000 dead and countless others so brain damaged they have no hope of ever recovering a normal life. For a total of $12 worth of electricity, psychiatrists in the United States alone rake in $5 billion. But the next miracle cure psychiatrists added to their arsenal made them more money than ever before. For it was faster, cheaper, and could turn every man, woman, and child into a patient for life. By the early 1950s, psychiatrists discovered their next miracle cure. A chemical originally designed to kill parasites in pigs, their new discovery hindered brain function in much the same way as shoving an ice pick into the eye socket. It was an old treatment in a new disguise. With the advent of these new tranquilizing drugs, it seems not too much to say that we're on the verge of an entirely new era in the treatment of mental illness. Dubbing it a chemical lobotomy, Canadian psychiatrist Heinz Lehmann described Thorazine as a simple, easy-to-take pill with the same effects as psychosurgery, but without the mess. Thorazine provided psychiatry with the entry into mainstream medicine. It had its magic bullet. If I'm a psychiatrist and I have to spend an hour talking to someone in psychotherapy, there's only so much I can charge for that hour. But if I can come in, give you a pill, and send you back out in 15 minutes or 10 minutes, that's a much more efficient uh, use of my time monetarily. What psychiatrists didn't tell the public was that Thorazine caused a crippling neurological condition known as tardive dyskinesia. And that's a neurological syndrome where you have muscle twitches, abnormal jerks, which are uncontrolled, and they either last for a long time or sometimes they're permanent. So that's very clear, very well recognized, long-term or permanent brain damage from these medications. Uh, Mr. Blount has virtually no signs of his original illness now, the signs that uh, the movements of his mouth are completely side effects of the drugs that he was on for 20 years. Uh, Mr. Blount is quite rational. He understands what's going on. Um, and if you're patient, he can carry on a very rational conversation with you. Even when you remove the drug, it may still remain. It means you have caused a permanent disabling of the brain. In the late 50s, you get the first signs of it, people starting to worry about it. But it's not until the late 70s 
that, that psychiatrists start warning their patients about it. 20 years. Thorazine's manufacturer, Smith Klein French, had good reason to keep a lid on the bad news. In the first year alone, SKF saw a 3,000% return on their original investment. With the public and the press kept in the dark about the severe and disabling side effects, prominent doctors and psychiatrists met in Puerto Rico to lay the groundwork for the expansion of psychiatric drugs far into the future. Psychiatrist Dr. Nathan Klein wrote this in the conference's final report. The present breadth of drug use may be almost trivial when we compare it to the possible number of chemical substances that will be available for the control of selective aspects of man's life in the year 2000. Dr. Klein spearheaded a movement flooding new psychiatric wonder drugs onto the global marketplace, backed by a massive publicity machine, spending hundreds of millions of dollars. Psychiatry was now an industry of drug pushers. By 1970, the American Psychiatric Association was so dependent on drug company money that 30% of its annual budget came from pharmaceutical advertisements in its official journals. So we had money flowing to trade organizations, we had money flowing to the doctors, um, and to their journals. Well, we all know that that is going to influence how they think. The majority of National Institute of Mental Health and National Institute of Health scientists are getting more money from drug companies on the side than their tax-based salary. With so much money to be made, all psychiatrists needed was a scientific theory to justify it. Their solution? An official report declaring that all mental problems derive from a so-called chemical imbalance in the brain, requiring drugs to correct. This chemical imbalance is one of the greatest fallacies ever foisted upon patients and the public. There is no chemical test to show an imbalance related to any psychiatric disease, whether it's depression, anxiety, what have you. The chemical imbalance is for the benefit of the psychiatrist. It has to be there so the psychiatrist can treat it. But fraudulent chemical imbalance theories could not hide the mounting evidence of common and terrifying side effects, such as akathisia. Akathisia is like an extreme nervous, inner nervous agitation. People describe it as wanting to crawl out of their own skins. And this happens with great frequency, and it is absolutely, totally well understood to be associated with suicide and violence and homicide. After years of these reported side effects and cases upon cases of violence, self-mutilation, and death, in 1991, health experts, legislators, and the public finally forced the FDA to order an investigation. I know with absolute certainty that if Charles had any idea of the side effects of Prozac, he would never have taken it. I had two sons, David Lee, age 8, Billy 16, the wife 20 years old, gone. I'll tell you why. After being on Prozac for 21 days, my wife shot and killed both of these two boys right here. She turned the gun to herself and shot herself twice. I took the 9mm automatic, sat down on the bed and put the gun to my head. And I blew a 4-inch hole out the back of my arm instead of my head. Thank God I was a lousy shot. Had someone looked further into Prozac, steps could have been taken to avoid it. What was supposed to be an unbiased hearing was a panel of psychiatrists, the vast majority with personal financial ties to pharmaceutical companies. They basically couldn't find an expert, a doctor, a psychiatrist, at a, um, a leading medical school who basically in some way or another didn't have a consulting agreement, hadn't taken money from uh, the pharmaceutical companies. I do not find from the evidence today that there is credible evidence to support a conclusion that antidepressant drugs cause the emergence and or the intensification of suicidality and or other violent behaviors. 500 deaths, 33 murder cases, and over 20,000 adverse side effects. Would you like to tell me why this drug is still on the market? Is there an, an, uh, an alliance, an unholy alliance between the psychiatric community, the pharmaceutical industry, and the FDA? And the answer is yes. This unholy alliance became all too apparent in 1997. 
when pharmaceutical companies persuaded the FDA to allow them to advertise directly to the public, with psychiatrists providing medical endorsement. And in just three years, sales of psychiatric drugs skyrocketed almost two and a half times. When the numbers of violence and suicide victims shot through the roof, public outrage finally forced the FDA to issue warning labels on antidepressants. But by then, 13 years had passed, billions of dollars had been made, and psychiatrists were marketing their next wonder drugs. Over 8% of the world's population has now taken psychiatric drugs, backed up by fake science and endorsed by regulators who are bought and paid for. Their harmful medications gross nearly $27 billion a year. And while psychiatrists were finding a way to diagnose and drug every person on the planet, on another front, they were continuing their assault on our most personal freedoms. Psychiatrists demand the absolute right to determine what is best for the so-called mentally ill. After all, the mentally ill are crazy and unable to evaluate their own treatment. To enforce their authority over others and keep their institutions filled at profitable levels, psychiatrists use a method called involuntary commitment. When you go to a real doctor, say a family doctor or a cardiologist, a patient always has the right to refuse treatment. So there is no such thing as involuntary treatment when it comes to clinical medicine as practiced by real doctors. Psychiatrists, of course, believe that people can be treated against their will. In 1956, psychiatrist Winfred Overholzer presented a plan to Congress intended to take involuntary commitment to a whole new level. The plan, purchase a million acres of Alaskan wilderness, build a huge mental asylum, and change the commitment laws so that anyone could be shipped off with no more than a simple nod from a psychiatrist. The bill sailed through the House of Representatives, but when the public caught wind of the plan, they became enraged, referring to it as Siberia, USA. The bill was quickly struck in the Senate. But while the death of the Siberia bill put a stop to their large-scale plans, involuntary commitment still remained the most effective and profitable method for filling psychiatric institutions. Again, the person has committed no crime and has no trial and is sent directly to a mental hospital, which is really a prison. How many people go to an insane asylum and say, please lock me up? Doctors don't lock up anybody. Psychiatrists lock you up. Even children can be taken from their parents with little legal recourse. They just invaded our home. They came in with officers. Our kids were scared. You know, they come in with a piece of paper and say, you're giving us your kids. And it's like, you know, how can they just come in and do that? She said, you could be arrested for medical neglect. And I said, but how was that when, you know, this is my child? And I, and I see that he doesn't need that much medication. Why would you threaten me with something like that? At 10 p.m., two policemen and two social workers came to my house and took all four of my kids away. Once committed to psychiatric hospitals, patients are drugged and restrained. The more a person objects, the more this objection is construed as symptom of a mental illness. At which point the person would be locked up in restraints. There would be the ankle, the knee, the waist, the head, the wrist, and the shoulder restraints. And if when that process was happening, if there was almost any resistance at all, the person then would be medicated to a point where they would, be, they would almost be knocked out. We had one case where they actually took a patient in a seclusion room and beat him up. And then uh, they lied about it to the uh, services that investigated. So it's a pretty wide range of, of abuse issues that we've encountered. Psychiatric staff provoke their patients into violence so they can bill insurance companies up to $1,600 a day for each restrained patient. 